Well, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Mike. <laughs> um, but yeah, so first I'd like to say thank you to the pastors for inviting me back. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but for real though, um, you know, it's Pastor Appreciation Month and these guys are just incredible. They're incredible leaders and they set such a high example for the rest of us. Um, Non-compromising, non-wavering, no mixture, and it's incredible. So thank you guys for being you. Well, as I was meditating on what we were going to talk about tonight, for the last week or so, all I've heard is, preach Jesus. So that brought me to a couple questions. Who does Jesus want? What does Jesus want? And how does it look for us today? Simple. Simple. Might seem a little foundational, but it's simple. So bear with me. <laughs> well, Lord, we just thank you, God. Thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you that you showed up tonight, God. Thank you for your word. And just uh, whatever you're going to do tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name. So the who. The who, who. We're going to start in Matthew 4, 18. It's Andrew and Peter. It's the fishermen. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And then... There was James and John, more fishermen. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them. <laughs> Bringing the party upstairs. <clears throat> so he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So what we should know is that these fishermen were probably pretty average guys back in the day. Hardworking, dedicated guys like Jeremy. Hardworking, dedicated. They probably weren't super wealthy, but super fishing was a super common trade back then, as fish was a staple to a lot of things. Food and other products. I'd say most of these guys worked for themselves, so they were probably intelligent and business savvy. They were probably known to have a drink or two, or even gamble. And I would venture to say that they might have even cussed a little bit. <laughs> these guys were normal dudes. But when Jesus called them, they knew who he was. And they immediately dropped their nets and followed him. Then we have the tax collector. It says in Mark 2, Then he, Jesus, went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Think about the tax collector back then. He was an enemy to society, to the place that he lived in. His profession was frowned upon by the people in the area. Tax collectors were collaborators with Rome, being that they collected their money and gave it to Rome. The Romans didn't even like them, and they worked for them. They were considered traitors among their people. And a lot of them were known to fluff up their collections for themselves. 
And a lot of them got pretty wealthy like that. However, when Jesus seen this tax collector, he said, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. The scripture doesn't even suggest that Jesus stopped when he invited him. He called him in passing. Because Jesus knew what he had in him, what he had to offer, what he could do with him. Then it goes on to say, now it happened. As he was dining in Matthew's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. So, so far, we've got some regular fishermen dudes. We've got a tax collector that nobody likes. And we've got some sinners hanging out with him, right? Then we have the afflicted. And you look at Luke 8, 1 through 3. It says, Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had seven demons, and Joanna, his wife, Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna. Then, if you don't fall into any of those categories, there's the everyone. Where he says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus offers rest to those that come to him. He invites all people. We are all people. In that culture, in that time, even by today's standards, these were not the righteous folks. They were the rough around the edges, hardworking, working class people. They were afflicted, they were sinners, they were lost and broken. I picture them as guys like me, like I used to be before I found Jesus. Get up every day, work, provide for the family, and then maybe swing into the tavern on Friday and toss a few back. Not a bad guy, but not living up to my potential. Surviving, making it, but not thriving through life. Just like them, Jesus has so much better for us. He wants us to come to him. We know that he paid the ultimate price so that we can have life abundantly. He came to level the ground at the foot of the cross. And when he called the disciples, there was no interview. There was no application process. They didn't know that he was coming. Let me rephrase that. They did know that he was coming eventually because they knew the laws of Moses and the prophecies about the coming Messiah but they didn't know he was coming to get them right then and there so it wasn't like these guys got up that morning and got haircuts and beard trims and put on their long sleeves to cover their tattoos waiting for Jesus to come Jesus came and got them where they were how they were exactly where they were and exactly how they were. He doesn't need anything more than a yes from us. A yes he can work with. With obedience and willingness, he can use us to change the dynamic in our homes, our workplaces, our communities, and eventually we can take over the world. That was a joke. Does anybody remember Pinky in the Brain? Like the cartoon? Yeah. Take over the world. (laughs) 
Jesus knew their hearts, and he knows our hearts. He knows the potential in us. Jesus knew the depth of their identity through himself before they even knew who he was. He knows the depth of your identity in him, even if we don't know it. He loved them. He loves us. So this is the same for you and I. He wants to meet us exactly where we are, exactly how we are. We can't clean ourselves up enough to be what he needs us to be, but he can do the cleaning when we come to him. He can get us to where he needs us, kind of, for the most part. We still do things sometimes. So the what. What does Jesus want? It starts with the simple invitation to follow him. He pulls on our heart, and then... Peter says in Acts 2, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Repent of our sins, right? Lord, forgive me for my sins. Boom. We're forgiven, right? We have to mean it. When we repent, it means to turn away from, to change, to do something different. It's not just words. It's like I watch this with my kids all the time, and one kid does something to the other one, and, hey, apologize to your sister. Sorry. <laughs> well, you obviously didn't mean that. So let's try again when you mean It's the same thing with our repentance. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in places. I've been there before early, early on, where it's like I knew I was doing something wrong, and I didn't really feel bad about it, but I knew I was supposed to. I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me for that, you know, and then go right on back about it the next day. <laughs> and, oh, man, Lord, I know I'm not supposed to do that, but I'm sorry, forgive me for my sins, you know. The real repentance, though, is when we change. When our heart posture changes, when our mind changes, when we do something different, right? That's part of what he's asking from us. Then it says to get baptized. And being baptized represents being cleansed of your sins, dying, being remade, and born as a new creation in Jesus. In Matthew 16, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The word follow here, and I think in the other, the other verses when he was asking the guys to come follow him, the word follow means to unite with, to be in the same way with union in likeness, to do what he's doing and how he's doing. That's what it means to deny yourself, is to be one, to be in one likeness with him. And to deny, deny means to utterly deny, no connection to the other party whatsoever, completely deny myself as though the old me was never even there. The cross represents self-denial. When we receive him, we are made brand new. We are given a new life. We can't hang on to the old life and the way of doing things. It re-hits that again in Galatians 5.24, where it says, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I know there's a lot more in the what's if we go through things, but... I really just felt like a, a simple, just boom, 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 here's a handful of things, you know, a good base, a good foundation to start on. So the last one that I've got in the what is Matthew 22. 
Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He wants us to fully yield all of the parts of ourselves to him, to love him. And to love my neighbor as myself. Why? If everything we do is founded on these things, there's no limit as to what God can use us for. Everyone we encounter is our neighbor. And if I love my neighbor as myself, when I see him in need, I'll help. When we see someone struggling, we'll offer prayer. We want people to know, we want the people around us to know Jesus and how much he loves them too. So, what does this look like for you and I? So first and foremost, we have to accept the call to come to him. Repent of our sins and invite him into our hearts. And remember that he wants our heart. He wants our yes and our obedience. You look at the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 and his encounter with Jesus. He's asking what deeds he needs to accomplish, right, to have eternal life. Then he goes on to lay out all of the things that he's doing right by the laws. But Jesus doesn't want the deeds. And he tells him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But the young man heard this. He went away sad, for he had many possessions. For Jesus, it wasn't about the stuff. It was about his heart. The young man had a heart condition, and he was more attracted to his stuff than the call that was available to him. So basically, if we want to follow Jesus, we need to get rid of all of our things. Your cars, your boats, your house, you know, your dog. Um, no, that's not true. <laughs> we don't need to get rid of all of our stuff to follow Jesus. But nowadays, people see so much status in things, and we chase after things just for for the most part, it's a perception of a status. So onlookers can look on and say, oh, I've got a nice house, I've got a nice car, you know. Which is okay. As long as it's in the right place, right? We need to be mindful of where those things are in our hearts. If it's a status symbol or if it's just stuff. Can I leave my stuff to follow Jesus if he asked me to? Or do I like my truck too much to follow Jesus? right? So we have to be mindful. We have to be mindful of our heart and continue make, continually make sure that Jesus is number one in there and we don't allow other stuff to encroach in his space. So I had quite a heart check this week in a situation. It was, <clears throat> if there would have been a cliff in Chippewa Falls, I probably would have jumped off it because it was like, oh. <laughs> I was out shopping with, um, with Lila for homecoming last weekend, and we get in line at Walmart, and it, it was pretty busy for a Friday night, like it was pretty wild. But we get behind this lady, and she's got all of her stuff laid out on the register. And we just walk up, cool, whatever, we're going to wait. And then while we're waiting, I realize that the guy in front of her is like, he's just counting money out. Like he's got just a wad of cash, and he doesn't really understand what's going on. And he didn't have enough money, was, was the, the moral of the story, is he 
I, I noticed, you know, he was counting the cash out and he was swiping different cards. And then I looked up and he had um, dollar stacks of quarters going from the candy all the way to the, the carousel where the bags are. And I was like, okay. All right, Lord, my finances have been a little weird this week, but I'm going to go do it. So I went around, and I grabbed my wallet, and I looked up, and I seen his total, and my stomach dropped. I said, oh, and I, I went right back to the line, <laughs> and then I stood there. And it's, it was wild because this, the Lord's been talking to me about finances all year. And at the beginning of the year, like him and I had a conversation and my, my, the cry of my heart is to pay off debt so I can, I can sow into things, so I can sow into missions, so I can give, you know, I, I'm in school and I see these guys that like every week, hey, I need help with tuition, I need help with tuition and I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to do the things like at the grocery store, you know, or at, like at Walmart the other night, but I totally backed down, like I totally went back and I stood there and I felt absolutely awful that I didn't, I didn't help the guy, like, seriously, if there would have been a cliff, I would have just walked out the door, and, you know, well, the longer I stood there, I could see the girl that was helping him was struggling, and she, she looked over at another guy, and I could see her say, help me, so another employee came over, and helped her out with this situation, now, I didn't, I didn't realize when I seen the number on the till that they hadn't counted any of the money that he had already sitting there. So when I seen $300, I was like, can't do it, you know? So they get this guy all counted up and then the employee that came to help, he pulls his card out and he swipes it. It was $25. The man was short 25 bucks. So in my, in my moment, of understanding, I got scared of a number. And I missed an opportunity to bless somebody. And I got scared over 25 bucks. What would have been 25 bucks? But that was a heart changing moment. Like I have faith in the Lord that even if I wouldn't have had enough money to do it, He would have provided it, you know? But when the when the rubber met the road didn't happen so that was tough that was I've never felt so awful in my life about anything really I was just I almost left the cart there and and headed out but ultimately the repentance that came through that has changed well has changed me I fully believe that it's changed my heart and if I was in this situation again, that I would just full faith, full faith, and handle it, you know? So back, back to the call, I apologize. When Jesus called the disciples, they dropped what they were doing. They left their jobs and followed him. James and John worked for their father. So it would probably be safe to say that this job that they had working for their dad was going to be their inheritance, you know? When, when Zebedee passed or at some point was probably going to pass this thing on to them. So it's not like we would think. They left to follow Jesus. They didn't leave for better pay. They didn't know what they were getting into. It was Jesus. And again, I'm not saying that we need to leave our jobs to follow Jesus. These guys all had a very special call on their lives. And then Paul actually reiterates in 1 Corinthians when he says, each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain there, remain as you were when God first called you. I would venture to say, until God calls you elsewhere, but be willing and obedient to go if he calls you elsewhere. There are people all around us that need to know Jesus. And we've got a mission field right where we are. The disciples knew through the laws and the prophecies of the Old Testament that the Messiah was coming. I feel like it's so significant these days as well, because we also know that he's coming. 
His coming was prophesied. I'm sorry, his coming was prophesied in the Old Testament, and what happened? He showed up. Through the Gospels and the Epistles, he's given us a blueprint to prepare for his second coming. He even tells us in Revelation how he's coming back. Obviously, the question of when remains, but that doesn't matter because we know he's coming and we need to be prepared. So how are we preparing ourselves? How are we preparing our hearts? I heard something this week in school, and somebody was talking about this whole evangelism thing, you know? Like, that's part of what we're supposed to do as Christians, to evangelize, to share the gospel with people, to love on people, share our testimonies, right? And what was said was, when someone says that I'm not called to be an evangelist, it's the same as coming up here to worship and then not worshiping because I'm not Amy, right? Like, we're all called to worship. We're all call, called to share Jesus, right? So that's part of what we're called to do. We're called to share Jesus with those around us and what he's done in our lives. They need to know the who's too. And we ought to be sharing our testimonies with those around us. We should be inviting people to lunch, groups, church, all of the things. It's urgent. We need to share the good news. We need to obey his commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. If we stand on his word and these commandments, everything else will fall into place. If we love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, nothing can creep in and knock him off the throne of our heart. Amy, piano, please. Unless you want me to. So Jesus is looking for you. He's looking for me. He's looking for the lost and the broken. He invites all people. And his invitation is simply follow me. And looking for an open heart that answers with a yes. He wants our heart and our obedience when he asks for it. He wants us to stand firm on his word and the commandments he's given us. He wants us to see those around us the way he sees them, to find and call out the gold in them. There are so many out there that need to know the Jesus that we know, and we are called to share his love with them. If we don't, who will? Y'all want to stand? Hold out your hands. Close your eyes. Lord, thank you that you love us, God. Thank you that you've came and gotten us from the pits of hell, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you can use us, God, that you choose to use us.
I just pray for boldness. Just overwhelming boldness to just cover us, cover our minds, God, cover our hearts, Lord. I just thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for, for your grace when we miss the mark, God, and the opportunity to do it again. And we just pray a blessing over, over everyone tonight on our way out. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if we can have the ministry team come up, and then if there's any, any other prayer needs or anything like that, the ministry team would love to pray with you guys. Thank you.